What's up? What's going on, everybody? Hello and welcome to On The Pipe Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Tyler Shepardson, and today is actually Thursday, September the 22nd, 2022, years after zero. Trying out a little bit, a little bit different stuff, a little bit uh, different setup that we got going on today. I'm trying to trying to make things a little bit better. So this is this is this is what I got so far. But um, just showing a little bit of of intro video there, just as we got everything all settled up and situated. Um, actually, just posted everything on the the socials right now that we are live. But I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be an exciting show. I think we got a lot to talk about. Uh, I know we're coming to you a little bit late in this week. Some more scheduling conflicts that we that we ran into this week. Um, some of it was a little bit out of my control. Some of it was in my control. Um, nevertheless, here we are, and we got a lot to talk about. So thank you for being here, first and foremost. I uh, want to say thank you, as always. I appreciate everyone that, that listens along and everyone that tunes in to watch OTP. Um, means a lot to me and hopefully we can get this, uh, train back on the tracks and get everything rolling here. Um, so like I mentioned, today is Thursday. We just got off of a weekend at the loose moose. That moose was looser than hell out there up in, uh, up in Michigan. It was either right next to the UP or it was on the UP. All I know is that place looked awesome just from all the instagram stuff that i was seeing from people um snapchats that i was getting from people it looked like a a a really cool part of the country one that i want to get up and and visit sometime so everything looked really cool looked like a whole different world up there so uh the loose moose we're gonna talk about that talk about what happened kind of go through some of the results there and then we will also look at some headlines that we have going into this weekend at the GNCC. So three more GNCCs left this weekend. It will be up in Ohio at the John Penton grounds, but this one's called the the Burr Oak, I believe is is the name that they go with here. So Penton number two on the year, and then We'll go to West Virginia, which I think is in the greater High Point area, is that next one, and then Iron Man 2. So the two of the three remaining races are two of the three um, repeat tracks for the year. So they race Big Buck twice, they race the Penton twice, and they race uh, Iron Man twice. So two of those three are still remaining in this year's schedule and there's a lot on the line but we're going to get to that in just a moment. I want to start things off first of all Beta motorcycles. You hear me talk about them all. Look, they're on my shirt right here. Look. Okay. I got to get the the sides like what sides left and right. Like this is my right, this is my left. But anyway, Beta motorcycles, sponsor of the show. They've been on board this year. I do have a little bit of news. We'll be we'll be doing more stuff with Beta next year. So um, very excited about that. Very excited about Beta jumping on board with us. Very excited about Beta giving us the opportunity to to kind of work with us because it's been really cool. It was the first like I would say major sponsorship that we brought to the show. It's kind of opened the doors for some of the other sponsorships that have gotten involved with the show. And um, it, it's cool to see that what we're doing is is helping out as well. Um, some exciting stuff coming down the pipeline for OTP pipeline was, was no pun intended, but up to something season just keeps getting messier and messier. The original up to something season. We are still up to other things. The main part of up to something season, man, it's going to make all my hair turn gray and fall out, but we've been up to some other stuff and can't wait to share some of that. One of the things that we've been up to is actually going to be shared with you in just a moment, but all that is based on uh, Beta Motorcycles giving us that chance, giving us that opportunity. Um, we really appreciate it because the show is growing like wildfire. When I decided to start doing this full time back in April, kind of talked about it then. The podcast hit 100,000 downloads in April for all time. So we just hit our five year anniversary that we've been doing the show. And these downloads are only calculated through the actual, um, like, podcast apps downloading it so spotify is not included in that number for whatever reason um at least it wasn't beforehand it is now it's bundled into it now but um 
It wasn't before, not too long ago, but it's just download. So if you stream it, it doesn't count as a download. And um, if you watch it on YouTube, it doesn't count as a download. And our YouTube traffic seems to be picking up a little bit. And I hope that that grows even more when we're doing live videos like the one that we're doing right now. But all that to be said, back in April, the stars kind of aligned. That is part of the reason why I started doing this thing full time. And one of those things was that we just hit 100,000 downloads for the show's history. Now, a very exciting part is we just hit 100,000 downloads since then. So just this year, um, we're over 100,000 downloads. And that is real, true downloads, downloading it to your device and listening to it. Um, I keep track of all my numbers. and I kind of go through it throughout the quarter. Uh, I, I think there's probably, I would say, an additional ten to 20,000 um, on YouTube and then even more than that on Spotify. So I can track the Spotify downloads now before I couldn't track those. Um, but right now... Almost 30% of our downloads are coming directly from Spotify. So uh, when you start looking at those monthly numbers, it's probably an extra, I don't know, I, I would say more than like fifteen to 20,000 from Spotify that aren't included in those numbers from uh, what we just mentioned. So over 100,000 downloads just since April um, into what we're doing now, I think is really cool, especially when you factor in the YouTube downloads, when you factor in the Spotify listens and the downloads. Um, that's a really cool number, especially for a podcast that just started out doing this kind of stuff. And my goal, and I've said it a million times, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it is to shine a brighter light on this off-road community. It's to bring more eyeballs into the sport, bring more attention to the sport, um, bring more recognition to these riders for everything that they do. And at the end of the day, bring more money into this industry that is absolutely thriving. I mean, you look across the country, off-road races are filling up left and right. Even with gas prices, people keep coming. Um, so, that has been my goal from the whole time, and it's amazing to see how much the podcast has grown from then until now. Um, it's something I'm very proud of. It's something that um, I want to take more advantage of as far as getting that train back on the tracks and not doing shows on Thursdays, doing shows on Mondays and Tuesdays and, and maybe even dabbling into the West Coast Wednesdays. I've been in some talks with some folks on the West Coast about joining us for that. That being said... It's growing, and I can't thank you all enough for listening. This would not be possible without you all listening, and I know that was a long-winded rant. If you listen to the show quite often, you know that that happens from time to time. This all started with Beta Motorcycles. So Beta is one of the first like big companies that gave me a chance. We worked with some other companies in the past, but Beta is the one that actually went out on a limb and gave us a chance, and I, I can't thank them enough for that. And um, that I think is a lot of the reason why we ended up adding more and more sponsors to the show. And I hope as the sponsor list grows, the engagement continues to grow, um, which right now it is trending upwards. And I thank you all for that. Um, but I'm excited. I'm excited where this thing can go. And I'm still up to something. Um, yeah, that whole thing might a lot of people know what up to something season is. I'm not I'm not really bashful or talking about it. Like if you ask me at a race, I'll probably tell you what's going on. Uh, just not quite at the point to to really dive into the details of it. But we're working on it, and I hope it comes out soon. But back to motorcycles, or excuse me, back to Beta motorcycles, even more specifically. Uh, beta motorcycles will be at Red Bud this weekend. MX of Nations is going on at Red Bud up in Michigan. Um, the weekend of September 23rd for Motocross Des Nations. They'll be supporting beta rider Jeremy Van Horbeek as he competes for his country at the MXDN. Beta will also have on display their new 2023 motorcycles in the vendor area of the track, including the very much anticipated, their new 2023 uh, 450RX. It is a pre-production 450RX that the public can get a close-up look at. Find them under the big red beta tent at the event. The whole beta semi is there. So the off-road semi that goes to, to all the off-road races, it is up at Red Bud as we speak. You can go see all the 2023 beta motorcycles, including that pre-production 450RX bike. That is going to be what Jeremy Van Horbeek is racing it at the uh, Motocross Des Nations. And as everyone may or may not know, 
Next year, Beta intends to make their move into the Supercross and Motocross scene. They will be doing it on this 450RX, so you can get your eyeballs on that bike. They posted a picture of it. It looks nasty. I wish that I was able to go up there and see it myself, but the way that the world worked out, I'm not going to be able to make it to Motocross designations, although I still feel hear all the stories from the ones that have been in America in the past. So I'm super bummed that I don't get a chance to make it out to it, but I'm sure I'll see plenty of content from it. Um, so it'll be pretty cool. I'm excited to see that. And you guys should be excited to see that brand new beta. Wish I could be up there, but, um, yeah. So that is exciting. That's a new thing on the forefront of beta motorcycles. Can't wait to share more about, um, what we, might be uh might be up to with beta motorcycles moving into the future um so a big thanks to them also as always this episode is brought to you in part by zach tussle at raymond james financial zach is a racer and a financial advisor that helps his clients win when it comes to retirement and financial planning if you or someone you know wants to save and invest for the future or you're already retired and need advice for income during retirement. Zach Tussle is always my first recommendation. Find out more by Googling Zach Tussle or on their website at financialadvisorsdenvernc.com. Zach is a buddy of mine. Zach is alumni of the OTP show. If you did not listen to that show with Zach, I highly encourage you to go listen to it. Um, I would say 85% of it was about dirt bikes, his racing experience, his upbringing in dirt bikes, all the stuff that he races now. Um, cause he still actively races quite a bit in the A class. Um, and then 15% of it was explaining what it, what it is that he does for work and how that can help and benefit you. Um, there's no better way to get that directly from his mouth. I know I, I talk about it from week to week and, um, have a good concept of it, but, uh, you can go check out Zach Tussle, Denver or financial advisors, Denver, NC.com, or go back and listen to that episode of OTP. So you can hear from him directly and see if that's something that could benefit you. Spoiler alert. It is. And you should Zach Tussle, Raymond James, financial. Also, so we've been up to something. Here's uh here's a little small dose of up to something season. Uh well it's just something that we've been up to and something that we're proud to announce. We have a new sponsor coming on board with On the Pipe Podcast. And I couldn't be more pumped about it. It is the Steel City Men's Clinic. And you've heard me talk about it on the show before. That is because I have been a patient of Steel City Men's Clinic for what is it, September? It was like right when I left my job, so April, that was four, now we're in nine, so five months. I've been a patient of Steel City Men's Clinic. Um, as everyone, I would imagine, knows, I snapped my leg in half. I compounded my tib-fib back in December, so as I've been healing up with that, um, dealing with some issues from that, just dealing with some issues overall, and Steel City Men's Clinic um, got me dialed in on their program and have played a huge role in my recovery and also um, everything that I'm doing now to work towards the the future. So um, it's something I believe in. It's something that I've been using and um, using, or like I said, I've been a patient with them for for five months and um, just getting to talking. It's a, it's a really good group of people over there. As everyone knows, Ben Nelko has been on the show several times. Uh, Steel City Men's Clinic is his title sponsor. So that's another really cool thing is you can see that van all around at the races. Um, they're sponsoring an entire race effort that saw full gas championship get wrapped up. Um, Ben's currently leading the way in the National Enduro Pro 2 Championship. He was on the verge of winning the overall full gas championship. So it's cool to see someone like that, someone outside of the industry getting involved in the industry, getting involved in the sport, putting money into the sport, because that is what we need. Um, and not only do they help me, they help a lot of racers and they help people from all shapes and sizes and ages and walks of life. But Steel City Men's Clinic is here to help men like you maintain their overall health and wellness. Steel City Men's Clinic is different from similar businesses because it is a medical clinic founded by a patient who actually suffered from ED at an early age and a medical doctor who is one of the nation's leading specialists in bioidentical hormones. Steel City Men's Clinic understands the stresses and challenges that men face in their lives today and how this can affect performance at work, at home, and in athletic performance. That is something that they specialize in. They use the latest procedures and technologies to help you. So don't put it off any longer. A happier, healthier you is just a phone call away. So 
we're going to have the owner of Steel City Men's Clinic, um, Bo Hamlet. He's going to actually come on the show probably next week. I would imagine that we're going to get him on here next week um, to kind of like we did with, with Tussle, to hear from him directly, to hear what it is that they offer. Um, so I'll save all the 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 detailed bits and pieces for when Bo's on and he can actually talk about it himself. But I will say in the meantime, between this week and next week, uh, even if you're not completely sold on Steel City Men's Clinic, we're going to handle that when we, when we talk to Bo. Just Google testosterone and the effects that it has on you um, in your work life, in your personal life, in your athletic life, in your racing career. It, it's pretty crazy. It, it can have a profound effect on the way your body as a whole operates. And it's really interesting to to look into. So um, that is the, the main thing that they help treat. Um, they can treat you anywhere. So anywhere in the country, uh, they actually have people all around the world. So you don't have to be in Pittsburgh to be a patient of Steel City Men's Clinic. Um, I've actually never been to the clinic and I've been working with them for five months and um, they make it a really easy and seamless process and they can help you out as well. So check them out, steelcitymensclinic.com. But what I was going to say is just Google the whole testosterone thing in general. Um, I think from my perspective, I would never think to reach out to a men's clinic being 29 years old. And uh, I learned a lot about it throughout this process. So that's part of the reason of this sponsorship to kind of get that get that out there, to talk more about it and to explain it more in detail. You, you see it, but you don't really get to hear about it. So um, I look forward to sharing more information about that. And I'm very excited and very happy that Steel City Men's Clinic is on board with not only OTP, but on board with racing in general. Um, it, it's really cool to see them creating jobs, creating a full-time living from riders in the industry and how many riders they help out that aren't on their team that are on other teams. It's pretty cool. So like I said, hopefully next week we'll have Bo Hamlet on the show. He's the owner. And uh, we'll hear from him. And then we'll probably have Ben Nelko on again, and, and we'll hear from him as well. Obviously, he's a patient. Um, I don't want to break any HIPAA laws, but I think it's fairly obvious that it's his title sponsor, and he's been crushing it. And so I think those things kind of go hand in hand. So um, welcome on board. Still City Men's Clinic, OTP. It's going to be a beautiful thing. Let's get straight into... I say straight into, we're 20 minutes into this thing, but you know what I mean. The National Enduro this past weekend, it was the loose moose. The The mooses were looser than they've ever been up in the UP. Grant Baylor grabs the overall win. Let me sort some classes here so I get the information right. This is also, so I'm used to recording this thing just on audio. So I can I can look around, I can fumble around with papers, I can write stuff down, I can look at this other computer, I can look at this other computer. But now you can see what I'm doing. So sorry if I'm not looking at the camera. I hope that's not um, I hope that's not distracting. I got a lot of stuff in front of me here going on. But these results, Grant Baylor grabs the overall win. He grabs two test wins on the way to it. So he won section two and three. And that kind of set him up for the rest of the day to just maintain as he went three, two, three in the last three and won the day. Stu Baylor, usually our co-host for these weekend review shows. Got second place on the weekend um, at the Loose Moose. So in that number two spot, he won the final two tests of the day to close it out, but couldn't quite make up enough time to beat little brother Grant Baylor. Um, Ricky Russell, who's been on fire since coming back from from some injuries and some setbacks, um, he's been running really good everywhere that he rides his dirt bike at. He rounds out the podium in that third place position. One more, well, I guess I'll just go through them all. Craig DeLong gets fourth place. Josh Toth in the number five spot. And what we were going to transfer into, Ryder Lafferty ended up sixth place on the weekend. So I know that that is not where he wants to be as he is in the midst of this battle for a championship, an overall championship at the, the National Enduros. But Grant Baylor is going to make up a lot of much-needed points over Ryder Lafferty by grabbing the win and Ryder Lafferty getting sixth place. That's a big gap in those points there. So Grant Baylor grows his points lead um, up to 171 total points that he has there. So that is a 22-point margin. Yeah. 22-point margin over the second-place rider of Ryder Lafferty now has 149 points. 
but Stu Baylor has almost caught Ryder Lafferty as well with 144 points. So Stu's only five points back from Ryder. Ryder, we've seen basically lead the points chase the entire season, but now Grant Baylor moved into the points lead at the last round, and now he grows that to 22 points ahead in that number one spot. Now, we look down to our Pro 2 class. Speaking of beta, speaking of the beta boys, Jonathan Johnson, South Carolina's own. Jonathan, I would say Brody Brody is Brody Johansson. Jonathan Johnson is still just Jonathan Johnson. Sorry. You you know how it goes. But uh, Jonathan Johnson gets his first win, finally gets the monkey off his back. He grabs the win. He puts together a solid ride, and uh, he wins on that beta machine, that beta power. He finally gets it done. Um, I messaged him, and, and that was the the first two responses that I got from him were both about finally. And so I know that he's got to be pumped to get that monkey off his back, get that first win. And after you get the first one, I feel like they all just start coming coming along down the pipeline after that. So – Congratulations, Jonathan Johnson! Jonathan Johnson on that beta machine getting it done. Um, we just talked about Ben Nelko. Ben Nelko is fighting for that Pro Two Championship. He's the points leader out there, and he's actually riding on a pretty significant knee injury. Um, I don't want to go into detail with it because I don't know if he's publicly said that. I don't even know if I was supposed to say that much of it, but I think it's worth mentioning because he's battling through some pain. Uh, getting gritty, gritting it out, and uh, still getting second place in the Pro 2 class with that championship on the line. So uh, shout out to Ben Nelko. That, that's an impressive feat as well. Shout out to Jonathan Johnson getting it done with the win on the beta machine. And then Brody Johnson is going to round out the Pro 2 podium. So right now those Pro 2 points are coming down to the wire between Brody Johnson and Ben Nelko. So they finished 2-3 on the day. So Brody Johnson, I hope, uh, bought – older brother Jonathan Johnson some dinner that night because uh, he saved that what could have been a nine-point gap in points to just a four-point gap in points between Ben Noko and Brody Johnson. With that championship coming down to the wire, every point is going to matter in that one. We look down to our women's pro class, or women's elite class. It's the women's pro riders. Rachel Archer goes up there and grabs the win over the reigning, defending, two-time National Enduro champion Mackenzie Tricker. And Brooke Cosner finds her way back on the podium in the third place spot. She also found herself a damn like 20-pound king salmon that I saw. So uh, I know a lot of them stayed up there and did some fishing and... Uh, Looks like they they did a pretty good job. I saw some pretty big fish coming out of some rivers up there in Michigan. So that is the way that it shook out at the National Enduro, the loose moose over the weekend. Obviously, this weekend, we got a GNCC coming back up. So three more rounds left of GNCC racing. I think there might be three rounds left of National Enduro as well. Because there was five. They raced the last one. Raced. There should be three rounds of both remaining. And they're back-to-back weekends. So this weekend will be GNCC. The following weekend will be National Enduro. The following weekend will be GNCC. The following weekend will be... You get it. You know what I'm saying. You got the point. So we're in for some battles. We got some championships still on the line in both series. None of them are wrapped up except for one. And that's what we're going to talk about. The overall... GNCC championship, the XC1 GNCC championship could be wrapped up this weekend. And that's that's insane. Two rounds early. The 11th round of the season. We could see a champion crowned right now. Jordan Ashburn holds on to that overall lead. 212 points. Ben Kelly. Ben Kelly has not raced since round seven, where he tied the GNCC record for the most consecutive wins in the XC1 class. Hasn't raced since then. We're at round 11. That was round seven. Four races have happened since then. Ben Kelly still sits in second place in the points with 180. Third place belongs to Craig DeLong with 158 points. Fourth place is Trevor Bollinger with 148 points. Uh, Ricky Russell is your fifth place rider with 121 points who missed some races. And then Grant Baylor, I believe, also missed some races, 118 points. 
So that is the way that the, the points line up. So even after all of that, Ben Kelly is still second place in points. He will most likely get passed by Craig DeLong this weekend. Um, obviously, Trevor Bollinger, T's and P's out to him. He is out for the season, so he will be locked in with 148 points, which leaves the way to Ricky Russell and Grant Baylor to be able to make up points and and battle really for a third-place spot overall uh, for the season, even with the way that the, the season has went. And Ricky has been on fire here lately. Grant Baylor has also been riding really well here lately as well. So... Anything can happen. That thing is still very much up in the air. But Jordan needs six points over Craig DeLong to wrap up the champ. Am I saying that right? At the end of this race, if Jordan has a 60-point lead or more, then he's going to wrap up that championship because that will be the max max amount of points that will be up for grabs and available after this weekend. So right now he is 54 points ahead. So if he makes up six points on Craig DeLong this weekend, that will put him over 60 points above Ben Kelly, and that will put him over 60 points above Craig DeLong. And that's important to note because look how close that battle came down to the wire last year. It came down to the last round and it should have came down to whoever finished higher in that race, although it didn't. Um, we all know the the penalty situation and everything that happened, but also both of those riders, Stu didn't finish the race uh, at Ironman with all, I mean, the conditions of that race, I don't know how anybody finished it, um, but the point discrepancy from the penalization ended up not becoming a factor um, is the point that I was trying to get at there, but we saw that come down to the wire. Had that been perfect conditions, that would have been a battle for the win for the race and the championship. But um, neither Ben nor Stu finished on the podium that day. So when you start getting back into those points, it wouldn't have made a difference anyway. Everything is all fair in the world. That's not what I was saying. But the point is, is how close that got. We don't see championships get wrapped up early. We don't see championships get wrapped up at the 11th round unless it is an elite racer and an elite season every year in the past look look at the people that have wrapped up championships early Caleb Russell would would wrap up championships early because of the seasons that he put on but outside of that a lot of championships don't get aside until the last round Jordan Ashburn has the chance to get his first GNCC overall championship and do it two rounds early at the 11th round we could see an overall champion crowned this weekend all he has to do is make up six points on Craig DeLong so if Jordan Ashburn wins and Craig DeLong gets anything worse than second we have a new champion if Jordan Ashburn gets second and Craig DeLong gets third that's 18 to 25 we have a new GNCC champion if Jordan Ashburn gets second and Craig DeLong gets third, then we're going to have to delay it to the penultimate round. If Jordan Ashburn gets third and Craig DeLong gets seventh, eighth, ninth, then we're going to have to delay it to the next round. But how cool is that to, to have a shot at doing that, to have a shot at wrapping up the championship two rounds early? Um, I mean, the, the, the writing's on the wall, and we kind of talked about it beforehand. And this is a season where we've seen an unprecedented amount of injuries. We've never seen the amount of injuries in the pro class like we've seen this year. And I think that makes it more impressive that Jordan Ashburn has been able to stay healthy, to stay consistent, to stay in the race to the very end and set himself up in the position to get this done. You look at the top four riders, two of them are out for the year. I hate it. I really don't like it. I wish that didn't happen. But Jordan Ashburn has been right there on the podium all year long. Jordan Ashburn came back from summer break and won snowshoe. He's been consistent. He's rode smart. He's put in the work. And now he's poised to take home an overall championship for his efforts. Um, So that's a big part of it. I mean, 
to to be able to do what he's done and and to be there for so long. He's gotten third place the last two years in a row for the championship. So he's always been there. He's always been right there and consistent, ready to capitalize on an opportunity this year. And once again, very unfortunately, he's able to capitalize on this opportunity. Um, and I, I mean, unfortunately for the opportunity, the opportunity in this is is the injuries and stuff that have happened this year. But Jordan Ashburn has rode smart. He's rode consistent. And he's set himself up to be in this position. And he's in the position to wrap it up two rounds early. So, well, three rounds early, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, so that is definitely going to be one to watch for this weekend. Also, this weekend, we're going to see history made on another aspect. Nick DeFeo. He's a real-life T-Rex. It even says it on the back of his jersey. Um, Nick DeFeo, who actually just got ninth place overall this past weekend's Mideast Hair Scramble. Last GNCC, he was able at um, at the, the Boy Scout Summit up there in Beckley, he was able to tie the GNCC all-time record for youth wins. He tied JoJo Cunningham. And I think at that one, he also wrapped up the overall youth championship for the year. We saw him wrap up the YXC1 championship before summer break. He had to race the last race to wrap up the youth overall championship. And now he has to race one more race to get his name in the record books. He is in he has the opportunity to beat Jojo Cunningham's all-time record for the most youth GNCC wins and he just Needs one more win to do that. So um, talk with him a little bit. That is his plan this weekend. He's won every race this year and looks to make it 11 in a row this weekend. And that will give him the all-time wins for the youth overall. So that's something cool to to keep your eye on as well. As I mentioned, he was at the Mideast. Hair Scramble this past weekend. Started on like row eight or nine. Ton of traffic in front of him. And he came through the first lap, fifth place overall. And then he kept riding and he ended up ninth place overall on the day. And these are all pro A and B riders. So um, Nick DeFeo is on another level right now. I imagine after he gets this record, um, I would imagine he's going to move up and race a three hour for the last two races. I don't know. Or you stay down and tack on a couple more wins and make that record a little bit more untouchable for the next person. I don't know what his um, what his plan is as far as that aspect aspect is concerned. But I guess we'll find out in due time. But this weekend, we can see him race for that record. Um, this weekend, Ben Nelko is out. We've talked about him a couple times. We talked about his knee injury, and we talked about that National Enduro Championship on the line. So he is not going to race this weekend. But I believe he's going to take over the OTP socials uh, as far as the OTP Instagram is concerned and kind of be the on-site reporter. So that'll be cool. Uh, Knowing Ben, there's no telling what can end up on the OTP Instagram this weekend as uh, when he has the credentials to it. So he'll be up there, uh, obviously supporting Rachel Archer, who is battling for a championship of her own. Um, But Ben, it it really stinks because we talked to him a lot about racing XC1. And you guys probably saw our back and forth and stuff on Instagram that we kept having about racing XC1. Well, finally did it. Finally convinced him to do it and then end up feeling bad at the end of it because on the very first lap, uh, he actually got his foot stuck on a rock and it twisted his knee. And that's what caused the the knee injuries that we mentioned earlier that I'm not sure sure if I'm supposed to mention. So anyway, Ben, it's out now. Everyone knows. Uh, You're welcome. (laughs) Um, But... We saw him move up to that XC1 class, and he was going to stay there and race it the last four races of the season. Obviously, with an injury coming up, not riding at 100%, with a championship on the line at another series, uh, just decided to take some time off from this. But the reason I wrote this down, the reason I want to talk about it, Ben is the second rider that I have peer pressured into racing XC1 over XC2. And I kind of just wanted to, to mention it on here because... I really want to know from a rider's perspective the difference between staying in XC2 versus moving up to XC1. Because from my perspective, and I don't know, I'm an, I, let me tell you this. I'm going to throw my rational, rationalization out there. If you are an XC2 rider, I would like to hear from you. 
about your response to to what I'm about to say. I think, and this is exactly what I told Ben. Ben had some issues going, and I don't mean to pick on Ben. So if it sounds like I'm picking on Ben, I'm not. I'm just using him as an example because he's the one currently doing it. He's the one that I've had these conversations with. He's the one that I've spent all year trying to convince of this. If you are an XC2 rider, I think right now, and by right now, let's just say going into the 22 season, that there was four, maybe five people that could win the championship that are sure fired one of these four to five are going to win this championship. After that, there's 35 other people that race XC2 regularly. Then you look at XC1, you got six guys that are full-time GNCC XC1 riders, and then you got guys like Tyler Medaglia comes down and he races some. Uh, we've seen Cody Wett. Well, he raced XC2. Um, there's there's other pros that from around the country come in. We see them race at the beginning of the season. Um, they'll go in and and race a little bit of stuff, and then they don't they don't complete the season. They'll come in whether it's for training, whether it's for the experience, whether it's for whatever. But at the end of the year, there's like five to six XC1 riders that are in the points and have raced it for the whole year and get contracted to race the XC1 class. If you are not one of those surefire XC2 contenders, I think that there's more opportunity in racing XC1 because if you're not one of those five contenders in the XC2 class competing for wins week in and week out, even if you are in top five, I think you have to be in top five in XC2 to get paid at GNCCs. XC1 pays all the way to 10th place. There's very rarely 10 riders in the XC1 class. So no matter what, you're getting paid. You also have the opportunity to win $250 in the first corner if you get a whole shot. So I think at minimum, you're at 500 or you, if you got the whole shot and finished dead last, I'm pretty sure you've made $500 by the second turn. So you're going to get paid to be in there. Not only that, you get rider introductions on the live TV show. All the XC1 riders line up in the starting area. They announce them. They go ride down there, do a wheelie, shake some hands, go to the starting line. That's broadcasted on the only source of broadcast that we have in this sport. They say, here comes Ben Nelko on a Steel City Men's Clinic racing Honda. You don't get that in XC2, even if you're winning every race. Um... So there's that. You get exposure, you get money, you get a clear track, you get to ride with the XC1 guys from the front line. XC2, I mean, there's literally 30 to 40 people in XC2. Everyone goes in that first corner and then everyone's trying to win the race on the XC2 is the proving ground. Everyone's going 100% trying to win this race and they're doing it from the very first lap. And I'm not saying XC1 isn't, but XC1 is a lot more calculated. XC1 is getting in a train and pushing each other along throughout the race and then making those battles later in the race. There's the I feel like there's more strategy involved in it where XC2 it seems like everyone's trying to lead every single lap of the race. But if you get a bad start in XC2 and you go into the woods 37th, you got a lot of room to make up. You got a lot of ground to cover. And all these guys are competing. And all these guys on that first lap aren't going to let you by. And I know you got three hours to make it up, but that makes a huge difference. If you get dead last in XC1, it's really not going to affect your race that much, I feel like. Not at the beginning, because everyone's going to kind of fall into a line and everyone's going to stay within sight and kind of run like a freight train through the woods until everyone gets warmed up, comfortable, sees the track. And maybe I'm wrong about this, but that's just what it what it seems like to me. So you get a clear track. You get to ride with those more experienced riders. You get to key off of them. If you get buried back in the XC2 pack, and then you're right behind an XC2 guy that hasn't made that name for himself yet, hasn't developed into that veteran racer yet, and they're just bouncing all over trees, bouncing all over roots, but they're still right around the same speed as you, that makes it really hard to get around a person like that. And you're not really keying off of them. You're more looking for opportunities to get around them. You're looking at what they're doing and doing something opposite of it. If you're in that XC1 class, 
Now you can key off of these riders. You can see what everyone's doing. You can see what lines they're taking. You can see how they're approaching corners. You can see maybe they found something on the, the pre-ride or the bike in the track that you didn't see. And you get to see their lines. You get to see where they go. You can key off of what they're doing and use that to your advantage. And that's going to pull you even farther along. Not only that, there's no traffic in front of you. You guys have the whole track. So you have that whole first lap and getting into the second lap with no one in front of you. Then... Once you start getting into the lappers, the lappers don't know that you're there until that first rider comes by. And then once that once the overall leader starts getting into the lappers, then people that are getting lapped on the second lap, they know what's up. They know where they stand. They know the leaders are there. I feel like they're going to get out of your way a lot quicker. Um, and then eventually, once they get passed by like 20 people, they're going to be like, all right, this is BS. I'm trying to race too. But I feel like in that XC1, when you come through in that freight train, those riders are going to know what to expect. They're going to let you buy even quicker. I just feel like there's less traffic that you're going to have to deal with early on in the race. Late in the race, it's a shit show. Everything's up for grabs. You don't know who's going to be where. Um, a lot of those riders can't get out of their own way when it's that late in the race. But that's just the the perspective that I see. It. And that clear track and those riders to key off of, I think that's going to pull to a better overall. So now your overall results are going to be even better. So maybe you do get 7th place in XC1, but maybe that's good enough for 3rd place or 2nd place in XC2. Do you think you would have got 2nd or 3rd place in XC2 on that same day if you started with the XC2 riders and you had a bad start and you had to work your way through that pack? Realistically, you probably would have got 7th or 8th. So, I don't know. It just seems like there's way more benefit in racing XC1 to making that move to XC1. And I know... A lot of it from the two people that I have personally saw make the XC1 leap. I think everyone worries about it from a perspective like, oh, do they really think they can win the overall championship? That person really thinks they can race XC1? I I think that's a lot of what holds people back from trying. But like I said, I feel like your your race IQ is going to go a lot higher. I feel like you have a lot more to gain. I feel like you have a lot bigger of an advantage if you move into XC1 and then maybe maybe you you learn enough things to go back down to XC2 and then maybe you're one of those top 5 guys. Maybe one of your you're one of those 5 guys that has a, a chance at the title. Maybe that experience in XC1 gives you that opportunity to become one of those guys at XC2. But if you're not one of those guys for XC2, if you're not going into the season saying I can win this championship, I'm going to win this championship. If you're going into it saying, "Man, top 5 would be really cool this weekend." Man, I'd be happy with the top 10. Oh, my sponsors are going to be pumped if I get a top 10, top 5. If you're one of those, why don't you move up to XC1? Because then you're going to get paid. You're going to get a clear track. You're going to get more race IQ. You're going to get your sponsors announced on the live racer TV. You're going to get coverage in being in XC1. You're going to have more opportunity to make more money with higher up that you finish. And, like I mentioned, $250 for a whole shot. So I'm just... It seems like if you are in that situation that moving up to XC1 only would benefit you from a racer, from a sponsor standpoint, from everything. And uh, yeah, that was just that was just my rant. Uh, said all that to say this, bum that Ben Elko got hurt in his first start in the XC1 class because I think he's more suited for a 450. I think that Um, he could ride a 450 better than he could ride a 250. And, um, I think all those things I just mentioned along with that, I think could have really propelled him. Um, but I I also think that there's a lot of other XC2 riders that could benefit from it. There's a lot of other XC2 riders that would probably just do better if they were on a 350 or do better if they were on a 450. Like there's a lot of people that just don't gel with a 250F. So ride the bike that you want to ride, move up to XC1, get the exposure, Get the clear track, get the race IQ, key off of those things, get more money, do all of that. Plus, then you can sell yourself as an XC1 rider. And then if you race National Enduros, the Pro 2 class doesn't have a displacement limit. If you want to race XC1 on a 350 or a 450 in GNCC, you can keep the same bike. You don't have to go back to a 250 to go race Pro 2 at another series. You can ride the same bike. Not only that, if you do like a 250, you can still get all the benefits that I'm talking about from this and then just race your 250 in the XC1 class. You can do that. So if you're more comfortable on 250, 
race it in XC1. Um, that's just my opinion. And that's something that I've tried to convince a lot of people of, and I've only convinced two people of it. Um, it was Trevor Barrett. Trevor Barrett finally got him to uh, go up and race Camp Coker. I think he was one and done in the XC1 class. And then um, Ben Nelko raced XC1 this past weekend, which I'm – well, you know what I mean, this past race. So, anyway, if I sound like a lunatic, I would like to know that I sound like a lunatic because I think it makes sense. But uh, if I do sound like a lunatic, let me know. I just want to get everyone's feedback on that um, and, and where people stand on it. Um. Let's go into our XC2 points. Lyndon Snodgrass is pretty well out in front of that one. He's got 223 points. Ryder Lafferty is in the number two spot for the XC2 class, 187 points. Mike Wachowski, 183 points. So only four points separate second and third place. That's Ryder Lafferty and Mike Witkowski. Rui Barbosa has a shot to make his way up into the number two spot, into the number three spot. He's got 174 points. And then Cody Barnes has 161 points. So um, those are all going to be close. Lennon, like I said, he's he's in control of this thing right now. He holds all the cards. Um, would love to see him get the championship uh, just to see how he's put everything together since his time being over here in America racing and to be in this position um, with Lyndon being a buddy of mine. I think that's uh, really cool. So 223 points there over Ryder Lafferty's 187 points, which Ryder Lafferty has been been coming on very strong here um, lately as well. I think everybody can see that. So Ryder Lafferty still well within it, but Lyndon Snodgrass, like I said, kind of holds all the cards going into these last three rounds, still having that white plate on that Kawasaki. And then we look to our XC3 class, and this one is interesting. This one is going to come down to the wire. Brody Johnson, we know, is racing XC2 next year. Brody Johnson was one of the top amateurs. He was the top amateur uh, before breaking his leg at the end of the 2020 season and missing pretty much all of last year. He came back and raced some races at the end, but was out for the points last year. So that was when... Jonathan Johnson kind of dominated that XC3 class and won a championship. Now, Brody Johnson, on the same team, the same bike, same class, um, has been running that XC3 class and just racking up wins throughout the season. But Zach Hayes, who was the 2020 GNCC champion uh, in that XC3 class, is, is keeping him honest and keeping him right there. Right now, Zach Hayes does currently lead the points, but with XC3 being a pro-am class, they actually get two drops. So right now, Zach Hayes has 247 points to Brody Joe. It's so common for me to call him Brody Joe Hansen, and I don't even know where it came from. I just start calling him Brody Joe Hansen, and now I just stick with it. Um, but Brody Johnson has 246 points, so one point in the overall, but when you factor out their drops, Brody's had three throwaway races. You only get two drops. He's had three that he would like to drop. He's got an 11th, a 10th, and a 6th. If you drop right now his worst two, which is a 10th place worth 11 points and 11th place worth 10 points, that puts their drop points at Brody Johnson with 225, Zach Hayes with 205. So when you factor in the drops right now, Brody Johnson is actually in the points lead by 20 points. So Zach Hayes still very much in this thing. I know he would love to get a second championship in that XC3 class. And if he wins out the rest of the season, he could become champion. Um, that would gain 15 points. So right now he's down 20. So Zach would have to win out the rest of the season and Brody would have to finish outside of second at least once. If he got third, it'd be once. And then, uh, well, if you got third, I don't know. You get the point. Right now, with drops, Zach Hayes is in a 20-point deficit over Brody Johnson. It's 225 to 205 with those drops. But like I said, Zach's still very much in this race. It is not over yet. Um, as we mentioned, Brody did have three throwaway races. So if any of races like that happen again, then Zach is, is well in this thing. So... That XC3 battle is one to keep an eye on. That will come down to the last round. Um, but these other two, like I said, Jordan Ashburn has 
all but been crowned the overall champion for 2022. Lyndon Snodgrass currently sitting... I can't do math this quick. It's like 35 points ahead. So um, if he can maintain that and just stay consistent throughout the rest of the year, he's looking very good for that XC2 championship. And yeah, this past weekend, I got to announce the Mideast Hair Scrambles. That was a lot of fun. Um, it's always fun announcing those, throwing out the 10-second the calls. That's pretty cool. But um, then just keep an eye on the races, especially for bike day. Quad day, I don't, I don't know a lot of quad racers. I know I'm starting to learn more, obviously, and I know a good bit of the pros. But outside of that, I don't know many people. Bike day is fun for me because bike day, it's like I'm not even working. Bike day, I'm just standing there talking about all my buddies that are racing dirt bikes. Um, so it was cool. But I did want to talk about that real quick because um, Tyler Palmer, Tyler Palmer, right before summer break, we saw him have a little bit of an issue at a pit stop, spilled gas all over him and his machine, uh, bike cut off, so he went to start it. The spark from the ignition set the whole bike on fire, and Tyler Palmer went up in a blaze. Um, I'm sure you've seen the videos of it. We talked about it on the show when it happened, but ended up suffering some very severe burns. Um, so did Andrew Coffey, who was the gas man in that situation. But um, Tyler Palmer literally went up in flames, was on fire, everyone working to try to get that put out, ended up with some very severe burns, um, was in the hospital for quite some time, had to get um, skin grafts done and the whole nine yards. Um, very traumatic experience, very serious injury, very serious experience. Um, Tyler Palmer came back after summer break at Mideast, put together a good race. He raced GNCC um, at the last one, and then he raced Mideast this past weekend. When they came through the first lap, Tyler Palmer was in the lead. He led the first lap. And then going right outside the scoring areas when Rui Barbosa put the pass on him, and then uh, he remained in the lead ever or from that point on. But Tyler Palmer stayed right there with Rui. Rui Barbosa is a factory racer. Rui Barbosa has a good chance to end up second place in points, third place in points in the XC2 class. Tyler led him through the shoots on the first lap and then stayed right there with him throughout the rest of the race, which I thought was really cool. Not only, one, that he's back from that injury, and two, that he's riding like he is. Um, so that was uh, that was a really cool thing to see. Um, but... The last two laps, you saw him chip away time. So it's not like he was just holding on or it's not like he was falling back. Like he was chipping off time, making making ground on Rui. So awesome ride by him there. And then Mike DeLosa, um, those guys were all battling back and forth for that for that third place spot. Mike didn't seem too pumped on getting third place. So I didn't I didn't get the full details out of what happened out there, but I know he wasn't exactly thrilled about getting a podium. But I thought it was really cool that he ended up in that third place spot. So um, just want to talk about that, mention that real quick. Um, yeah, so like I said, Ben Nelko will most likely be taking over the social media this weekend and keep you up to date with what's going on at the Burr Oak. I will not be there, and the majority of people that I know probably won't be there. It seems like everyone's going to Red Bud. seems like everyone's going to motocross destinations. Uh, my group of friends is going, and I've actually heard a lot of people that are typical GNCC people are not going to the GNCC, and they're going to destinations. So um, it'll be interesting, interesting to see what the turnout will be this weekend at the GNCC. I, unfortunately, will be at neither one of those things. I'm going to a football game in Florida. Um, my stepdad got me tickets to watch the the Packers versus the Buccaneers. Um, didn't have the heart to tell him that I had two other places to be on that day, so we're going with it. Um, it'll be cool. I've always been a Packers fan. I've never seen the Packers play, and this will be Tom Brady versus Aaron Rodgers, two of the best to ever do it. Um, so I think it'll be a really cool experience. Um, but, yeah, so I'll be down there. We also – I've been meaning to talk about this. I kept meaning to bring this up. I put out a floater, and – if you guys hate football, just bear with me. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of people hate football. I got so much crap talked about me when I had, like, one of my favorite trips I've ever done. I went to all the NFL training camps. Everyone got so mad that I did that. I don't know why. But uh, I put a floater out for an OTP fantasy football group. I ended up getting a lot of hit. We had over 40 people that wanted to be in this, in this league, um, and we only took 12. So... Um, Kind of added some people. I, I did a random drawing and, and filled up that league, um, but then also cherry-picked a couple. So we ended up getting – we're in a 12-man league, and it's, it's going to be really funny because 
as a group, we've decided that whoever gets last place uh, will have to race a hair scramble in jeans and cowboy boots is, is what we're going with. Now, the funny part about this is uh, Josh Strang is in our fantasy football group. He's currently 0-2, so um, <laughs> there's a pretty good chance we get to see Josh Strang race a race in um, in in jeans because I guess – no one told him that this wasn't Aussie rules football. It's uh, American football. So he's 0-2 in our fantasy group right now. But uh, he only had half the points of his leaders last time, so it's not as bad as it could be. No, I'm just I'm just picking. Uh, I think it's cool that, that he's in there and learning fantasy football as we go. Um, ben Noko is in there. Ben Noko drafted a kicker <laughs> in the third round of the draft, and it wasn't even the best kicker. It was – the Steelers kicker, and then he drafted four quarterbacks. So um, his team is not looking great either. There's a good chance we get to see him racing jeans. Um, Bolton Broth is in there. Rivers Morris is in there. There's, uh, I don't have the whole whole list in front of me, so I shouldn't have started naming everyone in there. But the point is, is we got some fast people in there that uh, that might end up racing racing a race in jeans and cowboy boots because they lose in fantasy football. And uh, I'm 0-2 right now in our fantasy football group, so there's a good chance that it'll be me as well. But I've had one of the highest scoring teams both weeks. Just both weeks, I played the person with the highest scoring team of the week. So uh, I still feel good about my chances. I think right now Strang is projected to be in last place. Like when you look at the overall projection, so uh, we might get to see Strang racing some jeans and cowboy boots. Might get to see Nelco racing jeans and cowboy boots. It's gonna be funny. Um, but yeah, been meaning to to talk about that just because uh, I think it'll be cool. But I think that's gonna wrap it up. I think we got everything talked about that we wanted to. Um, thank you for joining me, especially if you join the live stream. This whole time we have been live streaming on Twitch, and so. Um, this gives an opportunity to see the show live, to see exactly what's going on, to see how we're doing things, and also gives you an opportunity to ask some questions. So uh, follow us on Twitch, twitch.com slash on the pipe podcast. You can find the links in all of my bios. We push these over to YouTube, so you can watch them afterwards on YouTube. And then even after that, you'll be able to listen to them on the audio versions that we always do. Um, so right now, I'm just funneling everything through Twitch to be able to watch it live. So I uh, hope you join me on some Twitch streams in the future. If not, I hope you keep supporting OTP because uh, you guys mean the world to me. Really appreciate it all. And um, sorry for being a little bit late this time. But hopefully we got everything worked out and uh, everything going forward. We'll be back with you next week for On The Pipe Podcast. I was your host, Tyler Shepardson. We'll see you then. the uh, on, you're on the live stream I'll just turn that off um so I had to work that into the to the whole live stream thing just because when I post the show it pops up on there but if you are on the live stream uh thank you for joining me thank you for for chiming in sitting with me uh hope to do more of these in the future but like I said, this will be posted to YouTube, um, and then the audio versions will all be there. But thank you guys for listening. I didn't know where to, to end this whole thing, so that's it. Um, appreciate it. See you guys next time.